So I'm here to tell you that um, we molecular biologists have fundamentally misunderstood the structure of genetic programming in humans and other complex organisms for the past 60 or 70 years because of the apparently reasonable but ultimately incorrect assumption that most genes encode proteins. There's a gene for haemoglobin, a gene for insulin, etc. And that was um, developed out of bacterial genetics, very simple organisms, and it was just simply assumed that you could extrapolate what people in the 50s and 60s and 70s discovered in microorganisms to humans. I want to start with one of my favourite scientists, Barbara McClintock. And if you don't know Barbara, you should. She's probably the giant figure of the 20th century in genetics. And this is her as a PhD student in front of her beloved Mays at the University of Missouri. Now, she got the Nobel Prize in the 1980s for discovering transposition, that is, genes that jump around, which she saw under her microscope change the phenotype of the corn. And she intuited that genes did more than encode proteins, the component parts. And so this is uh, an excerpt from a letter she wrote to a good friend in 1950. Now, this is three years before the double helix. She says, are we letting a philosophy of the gene control our reasoning? What then is the philosophy? Is it valid? When one starts to question the reasoning behind the present notion of the gene, that is, as a protein coding unit, likely, uh, which was held by most geneticists and the biochemists, the opportunity for questioning its reasoning becomes, its validity becomes apparent. What she was really saying was, and it was a deep intuition in the best sense of that word, that there are other forms of genes that change the patterns of expression of the proteins and that she could um, see in studying her maze. Unfortunately, she was ignored. She got the Nobel Prize, but she went to her grave as the great dame of Gold Spring Harbor Laboratories in New York, frustrated that people didn't understand that it was about regulation, control. Um, although she was fated, she was elected president of the American Society of Genetics in 1948, so she was valued, but her intuitions were not appreciated. So as I said, the assumption, based on the studies of what's called the lactose operon in Escherichia coli, one of our gut bacteria is very heavily studied, has been that genes are generally synonymous with proteins, that most genetic information, including regulatory information, is transacted by these proteins. And this protein-centric view of the, the programming of life reflected the mechanical zeitgeist of the age. Now, there's only a few of us in the room old enough to remember uh, but back in the 50s and 60s, the world was made of bicycles and smokestacks. Nobody thought about digital programming or any of the more sophisticated views of information. Anyway, it led to many subsidiary assumptions, despite a number of surprises that should have given pause for thought. And this is part of the history of science. You get surprising, shocking observations that people just sweep under the intellectual carpet because it doesn't fit their view of the universe. So the first surprise, which is where I got interested in this back in Texas when I was working there, is that genes in humans and other complex organisms are mosaics of protein coding and non-coding sequences. So there's a bit here, a few words, and then a stretch of junk, and apparently, a few more words, so forth. And they were called intervening sequences or introns. And immediately and universally, despite the fact that they are copied into RNA, of the gene, the DNA makes RNA, they were condemned as junk. But the equally, if not more plausible and far more interesting alternative is that other information is being transacted by these RNAs, which is what popped into my mind after two beers in a Texas pub on a Friday night. It stuck with me. Second surprise is that our genomes are full of retrotransposons, viruses, all sorts of things that were condemned as selfish DNA, but these turn out, I don't have time to give you examples, but the major drivers of evolutionary change. The third surprise was that the number of genes in complex organisms doesn't scale with developmental complexity. And this was uh, rationalised in various ways, but let me just illustrate this. And I've got a comment here. These enduring interpretations are examples of
what's called founder fallacies. Now founder fallacies are when people make observations in science and they try naturally and properly to generalise from those observations. The generalisation, if it can't be tested immediately, becomes the orthodox interpretation, then you know, sort of drifts into being an article of faith. And you've sort of got knocked down buildings before people will re reassess the initial guess of what these things meant. So let's look at development. Now, there's two organisms here, both animals. The one on the right is a nematode worm. It's one millimetre long. There's about a million of them in every cubic metre of soil out there. They're most populous organisms on the planet, far more than insects, and they only have 1,000 cells. The organism on the left, that's us. It's got bones and muscles, and I'll illustrate this in more detail in a moment. Uh, and it has about 37 trillion cells, opposed to 1,000. But the genome projects, which came around at the turn of the century, once the DNA sequencing technologies had advanced sufficiently to do that, showed that they both had the same number of protein coding genes, about 20,000. Bloody hell. <laughs> and it turns out even worse that most of these genes are orthologous. They fulfill the same functions. There's muscle proteins, nerve proteins, you know, etc. And many are common uh, with simple eukaryotes like baker's yeast. Now, the big shock that came along with this was that only 1% of our DNA encodes these 20,000 protein coding genes. So everybody assumed the rest must be junk. I mean, amazing. The question rises is how much information is required to program human development from the moment of conception to adult and to program our cognitive capacity and what form does it take? Now let's have a look at this. This is, I love bones. Bones are the most fascinating organ in the body apart from the brain because the architectural variety is extraordinary. So these are three vertebrae from different parts of the spine in three planes. And any anatomical pathologist can look at them and say that's C2 or L3. But look, at the, look at the architecture. Every bone in your hand, the flat bones in your face, your pelvis, long bones in your leg, all have to be programmed to precision from the point of conception. Look at the muscles. Every muscle's different. Every muscle's got a different connection point, ligaments. Plus you've got all the organs and of course the brain. So in C. elegans, that nematode worm, that thousand cells, the complete history of every cell in that worm has been mapped under the microscope from the point of conception. The same precision has to occur in humans. If you look at identical twins, they're phenocopies. So the differences between us as individuals is not, you know, in utero problems or variations. It's actually variations in our sequence. So in the case of the worm, when you've got a thousand cells in that tiny little thing, it takes two thousand cell fate decisions. In our case, we have something of the order of 80 trillion cell fate decisions have to be made with perfect accuracy from the moment of conception. And so I think you'll see where I'm going. There's only a small proportion of our DNA is actually um, devoted to the component parts, the muscle proteins or haemoglobin, and to our biochemistry and physiology. Nearly all of it is, is devoted to our development. So the first clue brought to this was that the amount of non-protein coding DNA increases with developmental complexity uh, as a proportion of the genome, the genomes get bigger. And we now know that irrespective of the extent of these so-called non-coding sequences, they're all transcribed into RNA. Dynamically, it, um, in different cells and tissues at different developmental stages. So you're forced to the conclusion either there's an enormous amount of useless transcription or there's another layer of information that's being transacted by these RNAs. Now the data supporting this came out of studies on high throughput RNA sequencing initiated in the early 2000s. And we were part of this group in, in Yokohama. And these studies were motivated by trying to use high throughput RNA sequencing to define the different proteins and their isoforms. 
But the unexpected and ultimately headline result was there were tens of thousands of RNAs that didn't code for protein that were being produced. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we showed that many of them had overlapping antisense transcripts from the other strand and had some evidence of these regulatory. So what came out of this, and this is uh, 20 years old now, is a view of the mammalian transcriptome. That's all of the RNAs that transcribe from our genome as being a continuum of coding and non-coding transcripts that overlap their splicing patterns, their promoters, their finishing points, etc., vary in every tissue and cell. They stable, just like protein coding RNAs, and they have all of the indices of being real genes. I won't go through the list, it's a bit technical, but um, I'll just go to the last two things. They show very specific expression patterns, much more specific than most protein coding genes. So here's a study we did with the Alan Brain Institute in Seattle many years ago, looking at the expression of these, some of these RNAs in the brain, mouse brain. And uh, the primary data is in the top set of panels, then computer transformation in the second panels, which gives you better contrast. So if you look at panel B here, this one, there's an RNA which, as far as we can tell, is only expressed in the core of the memory centre in the hippocampus called the dentate gyrus. This one's only expressed in the CA1 subfield and so forth. Extremely precise, much more precise than protein coding genes, which tend to be more generic parts, as I said. We found uh, lots of these things. We also found that they were trafficked to very specific places in the cell, to the cytoplasm, mostly go to the nucleus, some decorating unknown structures, still unknown, that we're trying to purify, others that we have characterised, and then some go into the ends of nerves. And one of these things, just to give you an illustration, that we, was first discovered by a Japanese group called Gamafu, we were able to show that this thing is acutely downregulated in response to neuronal activation and has all of the hallmarks of the, of the genetic changes that are associated with schizophrenia and is one of the prime candidates for the you know, variations that cause that, that disorder. Um, now, it gets a bit technical, I'm sorry, but I'll try and skim through this, but um, <coughs> large studies of genomic variation around the world with tens if not hundreds of thousands of people trying to map the genetic variations that affect complex diseases and disorders and traits um, have shown that they map mainly to non-coding regions. So they generate this sort of plots, and here's the one for intelligence. So there's a whole genome and then this, this, the signal in different parts of the genome, and they're called Manhattan plots for obvious reasons. So where the dots go right up, that's a place in the genome that's associated, in this case, with intelligence, however that was measured. So it turns out that hardly any of them are in protein coding regions. They're nearly all intronic or intergenic, that is non-coding, which means they're regulatory. And it's well accepted out there in evolutionary biology that the differences between species, what's called adaptive radiation, whether it's in the primates or the mammals or the vertebrates, is mainly due to regulatory variation changing the patterns of gene expression rather than the nature of the key components, although they do evolve slowly as well. So some years ago, and Kate knows Marcel, who's now Dean of Science at the University of Sydney, uh, and uh, his great student Ninet and the rest of us looked at um, the RNAs coming out of regions associated with all these different sorts of complex traits and disorders. And here's one example. Um, the red bar there is the region of the genome that's associated with cognitive performance. Nothing in the database down the bottom. This is the, um, the tag we use. And you can see that right in the middle of this locus associated with cognitive performance is a multi-exonic, long non-coding RNA that doesn't code for protein which really has to be a prime candidate for whatever the mechanistic basis of superior cognitive performance may be. And we, in fact, showed most of these loci identified by these genetic studies express these RNAs. And we also showed that they come out, don't bother reading the text, 
um, they're associated with those involved in neuropsychiatric functions. We also showed, um, and, uh, as did other groups, that these RNAs are very dynamically expressed during differentiation development, embryonic stem cell development, neuronal stem cell development, immune cell activation, muscle differentiation, breast cancer and mammary development, etc. And um, over the years, the evidence has been slowly accumulating that these RNAs are involved in all sorts of developmental processes, and this is just a sort of list of brain development, limb development, etc. And here's one example of a thing which is called co chaser, which when it's in heterozygous state, produces skeletal abnormalities because the mice don't develop properly. They're also involved in cell fate programming, reprogramming, and are central to stem cell biology and will be major players in the commercialization or use of these technologies to improve human health. Um, Marcel and my group and another colleague, Paolo, who's now in Brazil, uh, showed that these RNAs are very dynamically expressed during embryonal stem cell development in, in, in vitro, in culture, and show for the, I won't bore you with the details, but show for the first time that these were in, associated with chromatin modifying complexes and modified histones. Now the DNA, oh sorry, I should say our friend John Rin also showed a year later that most of these RNAs are actually associated with chromatin modifying complexes. What are they, you say? Well, they're the basis of epigenetic processes. So epigenetics means the chemical modification of the DNA and mainly the proteins involved in the histones, which are the core structural unit of our chromatin. So our DNA is not just a string. It's wrapped around these proteins called histones in structures called nucleosomes. And these things are essential for development, long-term responses to environmental pressures, including things like type 2 diabetes and cancer, and also essential for brain function. If you knock out, knock out epigenetic processes, you cannot learn. Now, these chemical modifications are catalyzed by a suite of enzymes that have no, no sequence specificity, but impose these chemical modifications, hundreds of them, including um, covalent linkage of neurotransmitters in your brain, all sorts of uh, really interesting chemical modifications that feed into epigenetic memory and epigenetic control of development. And they occur at hundreds of thousands, millions of different locations around the genome, different cells at different stages of differentiation. So the question arises, what determines the site selectivity of these enzymes? What determines the positioning of these structures? And what's the molecular basis of environment epigenome interactions? And the answer to all three of these questions is RNA. So <clears throat> it turns out that these RNAs are produced from genetic loci called enhancers. And most people in the room have never heard of these. And they only appeared as a term in the, in the 1980s, although genetic evidence for these things occurred much earlier last century. So excuse the text, but I've just got to whip you through this. Turns out most of these RNAs, these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of RNAs, are actually the products of genes called enhancers that don't code for proteins. So enhancers are genetic loci that control the spatiotemporal patterns of development, and that's been known for a while. If you muck around with them, you, you, you mess up development. They're estimated to be of the order of one million, give or take half a million, it's a rough estimate, in the human genome. These things, like protein coding genes, express long, multi-exonic, spliced RNAs in the cells in which they're active. Knockdown studies genetically have shown these RNAs are required for their action of these, these genetic loci that control the spatiotemporal patterns of our development. And the production of long, long coding RNAs from these things called enhancers explains their cell-specific expression, like I showed you in the brain, their rapid evolution under positive selection for adaptive radiation. So the difference between us and other mammals is not the protein coding set, it's actually the patterns of expression, longer teeth or limbs or whatever. And the genome-wide incidence of all of the um, signatures of active genes. 
this also resolves the so-called G-value enigma, which is the G-value enigma was 20,000 protein-coding genes in a tiny worm and 20,000 in us. That's an enigma. In fact, we have around about a million genes, whereas the worm doesn't. 20,000 of which can code for proteins, and the rest of which code for these RNAs that organise the patterns of expression. So they're the architectural plants. And this is, now it's getting a little technical, but I'm almost done. Um, this is probably the most exciting area of cell biology that's emerged in the last decade or 15 years. And that is our cells actually very beautifully organised internally, not just with membrane-bound structures like mitochondria, but micro-domains that are actually liquid physics, phase-separated domains that organise virtually the entire nucleus and the cytoplasm. Even translation is a phase-separated domain. And here's some pictures of long encoding RNAs, and you see the dots. They're in very precise locations. And probably a bit technical, but basically, these RNAs are forming, binding to the chromatin to bring it into a complex that then determines which genes are expressed in the next phase of cell division. Because remember, from the first of a moment of our conception, 80 trillion decisions have to be made with accuracy. Divide or differentiate, divide or differentiate, divide or differentiate, all the way up to birth and puberty. And if you stain for RNA talking to DNA, there was RNA DNA structures, the nucleus looks like the Milky Way. It's all over the place. Now these, these RNAs are actually scaffolds that bind proteins, that can modify the chromatin, the epigenetic marks, transcription factors that determine which genes are transcribed, and also then bind to other RNAs or DNA to target these complexes to their right places. So here's a view from an article I wrote uh, last year. So in 1980, the amount in blue there at the top about how much was protein coding was not known. It was speculated 100,000 genes, 500,000, but once the genomes have been sequenced, it turned out only, in our case, 1% was protein coding, another 1% regulatory for those sequences, and the rest was thought to be non-functional. But today, we now know the whole genome is functional, and most of it is devoted to the production of these enhancer RNAs that control our development from conception. We also know, and I don't have time to talk about this in detail, but the RNA is the substrate for the epi environmental interactions. So the RNA is extensively edited and modified in response to environmental signals, particularly in the brain. So what's hardwired to control our development, to put fingers and toes in the right places, is then softwired in the brain by superimposing chemical modifications. Now, there's fantastic commercial opportunities here because we can use our knowledge of this to manipulate immune responses um, better vaccines, better cancer therapies with CAR-T therapy, if you've heard of that, and autoimmune disorders, which are probably the major source of the health burden. So we're actually um, working to start companies in that space. <clears throat> so to finish, you know, the idea that was popular when I was a postdoc and just from lazy assumption that what came out of bacteria was uh, extrapolatable to us. It used to be that the human genome was kind of um, oases of protein coding sequences in a desert of junk. But in fact, the reality is that our genome is probably the most sophisticated information suite that we have yet encountered in nature. Because the amount of cell decisions, that those 80 trillion, is actually 10,000 times more than the information content in the genome digitally. So the real view of the, of the genome is not oases of protein coding sequences in a desert of junk, but islands of protein coding sequences in a sea of regulation. And that's what puts us here today and what makes us different from each other and other species. And I should say most of the work was done at the Garvin and also my old institute in Queensland. And uh, I want to thank people who've contributed. Thank you very much.